Hello and thank you for joining us. You're listening to a We Do Talk with David Jakes. Today we're going to be talking about healthcare coverage and particularly healthcare coverage in the UK. Now, in a perfect world, everybody would have access to top quality healthcare and it would be free. But we don't live in a perfect world, and while that concept is available in some countries, it still tends to be a rarity rather than the norm. So today's guest is coming to me from London in England, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Amit Patel. So Amit, very good afternoon to you. Welcome, and thanks for joining me today. Thanks, David, and thanks for having me on. Amit is the founder and CEO of a company called Peachy. Now, that's just a small description of his background because he is, in fact, a doctor. He worked for the National Health Service, the NHS in the UK. And he spent most of his career, though, in business while drawing on his knowledge of medicine. So, I mean, I guess my, my first question to you is that you're sitting here today talking to me as uh, a founder of a startup. And most people that go into medicine, I think, stay there for most of their career. Um, people do go off into other things in business, but having a former surgeon running a startup and starting a company, I would say is pretty rare. Is that as unique as it sounds? <laughs> um, I guess uh, where I left medicine 15 years ago, and so I would consider myself as part of the cohort of people that were pathfinding their way into new careers outside of medicine. I think now, today, um, it's much more common to hear of doctors that have qualified, maybe not even practice, who have jumped ship and um, started a, a path down alternative careers, much more common. And the startup space, and the, particularly the health tech startup space, is full of people who um, you know, started off careers in medicine and then, and then basically left. But I would say you know, back in the day I did it, it was a huge leap. Um, and a massive decision to make to kind of change change careers. And, and I didn't transition into a startup at that point. I actually went into strategy uh, consult and M&A consulting. It tends to make sense that having a qualification, a very good qualification in, in medicine would equip you to do a lot of different things. Uh, here in Silicon Valley and working in the business and finance world, I know many people who are lawyers but don't practice law. They go into corporate development, they go into business, they go into M&A, they go into investment banking and things like that. So it does make sense that somebody could take their, their knowledge and their training in medicine and, and go and do something else. So um, I, I would say that you were an, an innovator of the time and I really want to hear a little about Peachy and what you're doing because that I look at as an innovative solution to private health insurance. And as a little bit of a background uh, for people that are watching, a few weeks ago, I did interview a guy called Mike Montgomery. Um, he also goes by the handle Health Unicorn Mike. And he did uh, talk here with me about health insurance in the US. And uh, for the benefit of people who are not in the US, um, it is very much a private health insurance market. Um, you have to have health insurance of some sort, which is generally paid for either out of pocket yourself or by your employer. But in the UK, there is this wonderful organization called the National Health Service, uh, commonly known as the NHS, that has been around for, I think, about 90 years, 80 or 90 years. So some people would argue that with a good National Health Service in the UK, that private health insurance is not really necessary. So, I mean, what's your take on that? Would you say that there is a room for private health insurance? Is it a failing of the NHS that it doesn't provide everything for everyone? What does the market look like in the UK? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. Uh, question. I think, firstly, the, the NHS is our national treasure and a great ideal around which I rally a lot having worked in, in it. You know, the, the notion that um, healthcare is free at the point of delivery and access, if you like, um, but, but arguably it isn't because we pay taxes and those taxes fund the budget that is required to run the NHS. Um, the reality of life, I think, right now, particularly post-pandemic, is the NHS is crushed. Um, you know, the, the demand for healthcare services has gone up. Um, in part because the front door of the NHS was shut for a while while it prioritised serving 
uh, COVID-19 patients. Um, uh, we, we've seen whilst morbidity or the prevalence of it hasn't really changed during that time. So we're starting to see those people who would have presented during the pandemic presenting after and later with things. We've seen new um, things emerge, long COVID, mental health issues as a consequence of working from home or managing life uh, um, through COVID. Um, so overall, the demand has increased. And I think the supply's got a problem um, in that, you know, uh, the, the NHS workforce is tired, you know, uh, from COVID-19 uh, and just working loads of hours. I think Brexit has had some implications on the workforce in terms of the number of people going back and exiting, like going back to their countries and exiting the NHS workforce. Plus, you know, obviously there are more restraints around decontamination, social isolation, and overall that's impacting throughput in the NHS. Um, and those two things, you know, are manifesting themselves in um, waiting times, for example. So, you know, waiting times for people, like people waiting um, on for treatment within the NHS has, has exceeded 6 million. You know, that's the highest it's ever been since these, these numbers were tracked. So I think there is an issue. And I think that that comes against or, or, or sort of works with the fact that people are now becoming much more informed around healthcare because of democratization of data through the likes of services like Google. Um, and people want choice. They want a better experience and they're prepared to pay for it. Um, and I think this, this is where, what is the alternative to the NHS and it, it's private healthcare, whether that's um, funded through in an individual's pocket by self-pay or whether it's funded through products, financial products like health insurance. And uh, one of the things that I remember, I haven't lived in the UK now for roughly about 30 years, but the thing that I remember uh, back in my day there was that if you needed emergency treatment, you got the best treatment, you know, ambulance services, emergency treatment, emergency surgery, anything which was of a critical nature was unquestioned, but it was the routine surgeries, routine treatment, which is where there always used to be a waiting list. It sounds like that side of things has probably got even worse. And, and as you say, a lot of it is largely due to the circumstances of the last couple of years. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it obviously varies a lot by locality within England, Wales and Scotland. But, um, you know, you're absolutely right. The, the critical things have to be prioritised and, and therefore the things that are less critical um, from a clinical point of view are sort of left uh, for longer. But, but that doesn't mean that, um, you know, the, the fact that it's impacting a particular customer, and I purposefully say that rather than patient, um, you know, that doesn't mean it doesn't fuel other issues, maybe mental health issues, having to live with something um, that, frankly, you need sorted out, maybe preventing people from working, for example, albeit it may not be critical from a clinical perspective. Yeah, yeah. So it's very much become a social problem. Um, so, I mean, I'd love to ask you a little bit about your work as a doctor. I know you said you left medicine 15 years ago, but uh, would you give us a, an overview of uh, your, your training and what you did and um, the things that you did and accomplished while you were a surgeon? Yeah, um, I uh, trained at Bristol Medical School. Um, I spent six years there. Um, I have an intercalated BSc in pathology, or molecular and cellular pathology, in fact, and um, an MBCHB in medicine. Um, as an undergrad, uh, I got a little bit bored in my fourth year waiting around, or third, third year of medicine, waiting around for clinics and so forth, and um, uh, decided to enter some business plan competitions. I won the Times KPMG Business Award in 2000 for writing a business plan to meet um, a charity's objectives. I picked a charity called Cancer and Leukemia in Childhood and devised a business plan to deploy a telemedicine solution for children with, can with, with cancer in the southwest. Um, and I guess that, that was at the point my real interest in, in business started to kick off. Um, I had a startup called um, MediCard, which was where I built a smart card based um, electronic medical record um, uh, and took it to prototype stage. And I guess I got to the end of like my undergraduate years and I was 
totally resolved. Quite, I'm a quite a practical man, and I wanted to um, do something that involved, like frankly, my hands. And um, surgery was definitely the path for me. Um, and I uh, basically did a professorial job, surgical job in um, the Bristol Royal Infirmary um, uh, as a junior doctor, and uh, s- then went off to Oxford to do an anatomy, uh, what's called a prosectorship. So I taught students um, on cadaveric prosections, uh, anatomy and genetics and various bits of physiology and whatnot. Um, following that, I started my basic surgical training in Bristol. So I returned and I was uh, across many hospitals in Bristol and then um, Western. Uh, and I qualified and got my uh, membership of the Royal College of Surgeons. And then I went up to Manchester as a higher surgical trainee in breast and endocrine surgery. Um, and it was along that journey, really, where um, I started to see some changes in careers in medicine. Uh, which I hadn't anticipated, frankly. Um, The working time directive uh, had come in. So where surgeons were used to working um, 80, 90, 100 hour weeks, um, and we can argue whether that's right or wrong, the newer surgeons who were coming through were doing 42 hours a week. And given surgery is an apprenticeship for any given year of tenure, um, you know, surgeons had less than half, basically, the amount of experience that they they would have had historically Um, and that was having a lot of impact in terms of their ability to work unsupported in theatre there was a lot more pressure on consultants at the time to be in theatre overnight and the kind of work um, life balance was kind of tipping I could see as I carried on in my career that it would become not as favourable as I was expecting basically Um, and I think the other the other key issue was um, the fact that uh, you know the the intake in medical schools at the time I went doubled, and then subsequently postgraduate schools opened up because there was a requirement for more doctors. But um, there was I think there's been a at the time there was a quite failure of workforce planning, and so there were too many juniors for consultant jobs at the top. And many people are being asked to go abroad and uproot their lives for two or three years pending a consultant job or post being opened. And all of these things, they didn't really feel um, uh, fair to me at the time. Um, Mm. And also the itch to do things more business orientated, like I did as an undergrad, um, was sort of growing at the same time. and so, you know, I did take a long, hard look at my love for surgery, but my um, ability to make an impact within the NHS by continuing in my career. And I decided that um, it, it would be the right time to leave and, and try and have a Im- bigger impact outside of the NHS, on the NHS or healthcare in general, um, by, by moving careers. And that, that's effectively what I did. And, and what came next after you left medicine? Did you go into healthcare insurance or did you go into some other kind of business? No, I, I actually looked at a number of uh, ways of diversifying my career, um, an MBA to kind of uh, get a qualification and kind of um, have time to think, um, uh, going to the pharmaceutical industry where uh, it was a well-trodden path to sort of commercialize um, one's career yet it would still um, leave you in the scientific space, if you like, um, or get into a consulting firm, uh, like a management or strategy consulting firm. And um, I actually uh, met a, a medical student kind of colleague of mine who had left as an undergrad from Bristol and gone to Cambridge. And um, I met him at a careers fair um, as I was exploring all these careers. And he happened to be in the management consulting industry. He never actually practiced after finishing his medical degree. So I gained a lot of insight around um, that kind of career path, particularly from the perspective of changing careers from a doctor and the kind of broad base of business skills that that would give one um, self if they were to follow that. And um, I ended up actually going to work in, in a strategy and M&A house called LEK Consulting. Um, and I spent... Uh, I think almost five years there 
um, going through the ranks, had a fast track promotion. And I say I, I basically went, went and worked for the dark side. Um, uh, we work for Fortune 500 companies, uh, private equity, and we help them build portfolios, grow their portfolio companies, exit them. Um, and, and I got a, a really sound and interesting um, kind of experience around how you develop strategy and how you think about it. Let's t- talk a little bit about your current business um, and what is Peachy and when did you start it? When did you first get the idea and what was the origin of it? Um, so I should just start by saying um, I, following my period of time at um, LEK Consulting, um, I spent uh, seven years at Bupa. Um, so I've been immersed in the world of, of health insurance, healthcare provision, digital health for eight years, but in industry. Um, um, and I did a group stra- strategy and M&A role. I ran strategy and M&A for the UK business. And then I was a venture builder. So that kind of is the setup for um, where, where Peachy has come from. Um, and I guess um, I've had a lot of vantage points around healthcare whether it's running businesses, flipping them, like delivering healthcare firsthand. And one of the points um, through my career at Bupa that became apparent was that health insurance is a proposition that people want, but it's quite complicated as a product to understand, um, to quote and buy, um, to, to, to understand what's covered, what's not covered. Um, it's also like not affordable for the massive um, because, you know, private healthcare is expensive. Um, if corporations pay for it on your behalf, then fine, fair enough. But if you're an individual, it's quite tough, I think, to, uh, to afford it for the general public. And then um, a- as I looked more and more as I was a venture builder into, um, you know, companies like Bupa, it was clear that they were not digital businesses. And in a world where we... The business is to um, leverage data and technology and apply that to manage health risk. Not having a digital business model and not having um, the ability to use data in real time, that had lots of implications. You know, you couldn't predict risk. You couldn't price efficiently. You couldn't evolve and have agility to move with the market. Um, And that kind of led me into thinking about how you could rebuild a health insurance proposition for today. So aside from yourself and Peachy and your your co-founders and team, are there other companies doing something similar or are you relatively unique? Um, There are globally. um, uh, In France, there's Alan. Um, In America, there's Clover, Bind. A lot of people will have heard of Oscar Health. In Germany, there's Ottenova. India, there's Plum. Um, In the UK, I think... Um, the market has been quite stagnant um, in terms of innovation, um, so to speak. And there have been, you know, like a handful of new entrants. Uh, Lime Global is one, um, Equips Me is another. But um, where, where we set ourselves apart, I think, are, are in a couple of areas. One, um, we're really out to um, be a data and technology company. That's you know in in the way in the way that we're approaching how we um, develop you know products for uh, customers. Secondly, um, we have healthcare expertise in the team, so we understand how healthcare is delivered, care pathways, all of that kind of stuff. So in in my view, we we just come from a fundamentally like different DNA or a starting place in terms of thinking about this. Um, you know, my co-founders are enterprise technologists that have spent many years in um, both beauty startups and um, actually uh, AIG, Friends Provident, uh, Underwrite Me, those mm-hmm. sorts of institutions. They've got a lot of domain expertise. But our first and you know foremost point is that's where we are as a company and we're obsessed by the customer. What have been some of the challenges that you, you've had to overcome? Because for any startup... Um, And I've worked with many startups over the last couple of decades. Primary challenges are fundraising, hiring people, and really getting your product out there and and distribution. I would imagine in your case, you probably had regulatory approvals as well. Yeah, I mean, um, 
God, uh, you've opened a massive can of worms here now. Um, <laughs> but the the reality of life is I st- started this on my own um, in 2020, three months before the pandemic hit. And so the first issue is the pandemic and um, having three young daughters to homeschool while starting a startup um, was quite challenging. The next thing is um, building a team during that time because um, as much as I wanted to kind of outsource or had the need to outsource at the time um, to get things done, I wanted to actually build a founding team that had the right expertise, particularly around technology, to basically build out our business and our platform. And that was quite tough in the pandemic. Um, uh, then, then, as you kind of alluded to, I think there is two key things for this type of business to get up and running, or three key things to get up and running. Um, regulatory approval, and we were very lucky in the fact that um, we were able to to demonstrate to the regulator that we would we have genuine innovation in what we're doing in terms of product design, platform development, and the way our proposition would work. And so we we are actually the first and only in Shortech to be accepted into the Financial Conduct Authority sandbox. And um, I'm glad to say that we got um, authorized and regulated by, are regulated by the FCA. We got all of those permissions on the 31st of March this year, but that was no small feat. The barrier to getting authorization is fairly significant at present. Um, yeah. Insurance capacity. So unless we're going to become an insurer, which we're not currently, we work with an insurer. Someone else has to lend us their balance sheet. And in the, in the UK market, um, that generally is not a modus operandi that um, many people use in the health segment. So securing that um, was, was, was quite a challenge. But we are very lucky to be working with Sompo International, who is our underwriter. Um, and a big Japanese um, insurer, um, you know, when we work with them to to basically bring our product to market. Um, capital is an issue, is always an issue. And we, for lots of different reasons, but specifically, um, and I think probably the main reason ultimately we, we didn't raise early is because we didn't know from the FCA how quickly we would get authorized, frankly. Um, and I couldn't look an investor in the eye and take money uh, without being able to confidently tell them when we'd be able to launch. So we, the co-founders and I have actually bootstrapped um, the entity until um, launch and we've just um, completed our fundraise. Congratulations on completing the fundraise and, and also on getting that regulatory approval because I, I know that that's a bureaucratic process and uh, it's not easy. So I'm sure that uh, you spent many, many hours preparing for that and writing up propositions and papers and whatever you needed to. So uh, congrats to getting to this this stage of the business. Thank you. So I mean, one thing I'd like to just ask you is, so you, you've mentioned two big challenges that the UK has had over the last three years. One is COVID and one is Brexit. And they've put a lot, both of those events have put a lot of challenges, but what about opportunities? Do you look at things like co- as we come out of COVID and as, Brexit is now largely behind us and the UK has got itself into a a state of progression now outside of the EU. Does that present any good opportunities for a business like Peachy? There are lots of opportunities. I think, you know, there's a cost of living crisis going on at the moment. Um, You know, healthcare um, provided through the NHS is... Uh, harder to access than it has been given everything we've spoken about already Um, and people are you know when they get concerned about access to healthcare they start to think about the alternatives and we've seen this in the market with growth in volume of um, policies sold in the health um, insurance space we've seen it in the number of people turning to private healthcare via self-pay um, and, and both of those segments have been growing um, since the pandemic uh, uh, has, has been happening. So for us, um, the time is like sort of nigh now to get out into market. But the cost of living crisis is creating problems around affordability and 
you know, health insurance is almost like a supernumerary or discretionary product here because the NHS is around. But still, you know, in the market that we're going after, um, whether it's millennials as end consumers or those in um, micro and small businesses, um, you know, pe people want peace of mind. They're prepared to spend money. They're creating budgets, in fact, within their household spend to be able to get these types of products to give them peace of mind. And in the small um, like business space, as you know, many of these businesses, anything startup is tech. It's a tech focused business. Um, and the reality of life is there's a massive war on talent and, you know, just purpose, um, salary, benefits package, all of those things are quite important when thinking about the employee value proposition. And, and, and that's where I think, you know, we will um, fare well in terms of um, Peachy, but also because we deliver Peachy on a digital fabric. Um, unlike the other insurers with a digital business model, I think an operating model, I think that is what um, will stand us the test of time in terms of scalability, cost efficiencies, customer experience, and frankly, agility, the ability to move products and proposition and platform um, as the market changes, which it does at lightning pace these days. A great vision for the company. And uh, I think you look to me anyway, like you're poised for uh, potentially great success. So um, I certainly hope it is that way and, and wish you all the best with it. But uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to ask you a couple of other things. So, I mean, you have changed careers, you've followed your instinct, followed your gut, done what you wanted to do. And you look to me like the sort of person that would never be satisfied to just sit back and take what comes at you. You're, you like to be very much in control of your destiny. We're hearing a lot about people resigning, people moving careers, people getting burnt out. And I'm seeing a great shift away from conventional corporate work across all industries and people going more into doing their own thing, trying to start their own company, even just going out on their own as a freelancer. So you've done that yourself. Um, so if somebody is sitting out there being very unfulfilled in their current job or their current work, but would like to go and do something else. They have a great idea. They feel they could do it on their own, but that's a very intimidating, scary thing to do. What type of advice would you give someone that has the desire to go out and do their own thing, but just doesn't quite know how to get started? Yeah, I mean, for me, the fundamental thing um, is live a life with no regrets. And, you know, we all have like finite amounts of time in our careers. Um, however long they span and you know for me you know you should be happy and if you have a passion to do something else and it's burning inside you then I think there is a need and um, a necessity to go and explore that in some way shape or form um, and that's kind of the like gut instinct that I have for mostly everything you know don't live life with regrets go and explore it, go think about it, um, and, and make some inroad towards understanding whether that's the right path for you. Um, and so, so that, that's the kind of irrational, emotional side of things, the passion, etc. I think that the reality, the pragmatic part of things is something that, you know, people ought to consider as well. I mean, I took the jump um, at the age to, to build a startup at the age of 42, and I have three young children in private school, a mortgage and all of those things. And the one thing my wife and I did not like we're not going to compromise on is is our kids education. So um, everyone will be at different life stages when they take the leap and have, you know, it's a different risk profile for everyone. And one would argue that I've got experience to be able to do the jump. But um, maybe, you know, my overheads are so big that I was just crazy doing it. But. I think the pragmatic element has to come in. And I, I did a lot of soul searching and thinking around what I might do whilst I was in role um, uh, and, and then decided to take the jump. And, you know, I think other people giving advice to other people, they should do the same, like de-risk any move as much as possible before you actually make it because, you know, it's quite substantial and can have um, uh, massive repercussions. But if you've done that, 
and you're passionate about what you plan to move on to do, there is half a chance that it's going to succeed. And if it doesn't, pivot. Yeah. And I, I think uh, what you say here, you know, two things that resonate very much with me. What I often tell people is don't grow old and live with regrets. So don't, don't be 80 years old looking back on your life saying, oh, I wish I had done whatever. You know, the opportunity to do that, maybe it's now, maybe it's in a year or two, maybe it's at some point in the future, but, but try not to grow old and look back and, and live with regrets. And the other thing is, I truly believe you're never too old to start something new. Uh, you know, three years ago, I never would have imagined that I would be hosting a podcast channel. And this is episode 67 in just over two years. I never would have thought I would be doing that. So uh, for anybody that thinks that they, they might be too old to train into something new, for, if it takes a lot of training, maybe that is a, a realistic barrier that you might have to observe. But uh, for many things, um, I think it is a state of mind and there's a lot of things you can do regardless of your age. Uh, I think there's also a lot to be said for having some experience and starting a company in your 40s, you're a lot more experienced in life, you're experienced in business, whatever that business might be, rather than somebody recently graduated from university who has a great idea. They may have a great brain and they may have vision, but they don't have the experience. So wisdom does come with age. I think that's, <laughs> that's something we, we can say. <laughs> the risk is not, not lower though. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Risk is there regardless yeah. of the age. Amit, thank you for sharing all of your, your thoughts with us. If anybody would like to learn more about Peachy, learn more about your business, uh, what's the best way of finding out? What's your website and how could somebody contact you if they needed to? Yeah. So our web address is www.peachy.health and um, contacting me, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, um, usually post quite frequently. Um, or uh, you can email me on ap at peachy.health. Okay, well, I wish you every success. I'd love to keep in touch with you and follow your business and see where you end up because I think you have the potential to do a lot of great things here. Thank you so much for having me on, David. My pleasure. Thank you for your time. And thank you everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please feel free to leave your comments below and subscribe to our channel. We upload a new one every week and I'll see you next time. We upload and we do talk every week. So if you enjoyed this one, please subscribe and leave your comments below.